after they marry. And every time he steps away from her, he writes her a letter. And they are packed with historical details. And the other reason it's kind of good as a Pride and Prejudice theme is he was really lowly. He gets a little uppity now that he's the only, he's the only in-law of the new earl. So everybody wants his attention. And every, he gets invited to all kinds of fancy parties and uh, the bankers you know, take him to dinner a lot and stuff. And uh, anyway, he becomes a much higher status person than ever before. So let me ask, uh, let me answer questions now, and then um, if you want to see any other later things about it. This is just the first part of the story. Ceylon is going to be an epic chapter. You just won't believe all the things that happened to him while he's in Ceylon. But let me an uh, answer the questions you have. You mentioned that they fought in the American Revolution. Where, where were they? Let me think if I can. Um, Guilford Courthouse. So our guy, the Earl, who becomes the Earl of Suffolk, her father, is in command at Guilford Courthouse, which is depicted in the movie um, with Mel Gibson, The Patriot. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. There's some footage in there of a recreation. When he is hurt and sent back home because of his wounds, the man who replaces him is General Matthew. General Matthew's daughter marries Jane Austen's brother. That's wow. one of my files. <laughs> it goes world. on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the other brother, his elder brother, who would have become the Earl, is killed in a naval incident with um, privateers, uh, private privateers, off the coast of America. She's in her forties. She's in her forties. So they've given up the chance to have children, because menopause, of course, would occur much earlier than nutrition and stuff. So there's not going to be any children. But also, by the time they marry, he, her brother, the new Earl, has a slew of kids. <laughs> and guess who her new, the, the new Earl, her brother's wife, is Lord Sherborne's daughter. And that is how those letters got to my village. So that Lady Catherine Howard Bissett, her sister-in-law, is Lord Sherborne from my village's daughter. That's how they got So that took some figuring out. <laughs> took a while to figure that out because I mean, it was just brand new to it. I, I didn't have any structural context to it. And then, on that note, Lord Sherborne's wife is the only heiress, because she has no brothers, to massive estates in Hampshire, literally a stone's throw from Jane Austen's. I mean, a mile, half a mile, okay? All this land around Jane Austen is now in the hands of Lord Sherborne, including her niece, Anna Matthew Austen. So Lord Sherborne's wife's, Lord Sherborne's sister lives with Lady Catherine Howard full time. And yet he's the Lord of the Manor for all the lands around Jane Austen, including Jane Austen's niece, who's General Matthew's daughter. It's just this connection is, is rather striking. I want to show you one other thing. If you've got this time, I want to show you one other news article. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mariah Edgeworth. But if we could bring back somebody from the dead from the 19th century, they would know who she was. They would own several of her books. They might not have heard of Jane Austen back then, but they would know Mariah Edgeworth. Mariah Edgeworth went in 1821 to visit Lady Catherine Bissett, and she wrote a letter to her stepmom, who was about a year older than her. This is her fourth stepmom, long story. But Mariah Edgeworth is writing a letter about her travels in England, because she's an Irish girl. 
and she's writing, and she says, after breakfast, we set out to see Charlton, Malmesbury Abbey, and Lady Catherine Bissett. As if Lady Catherine Bissett is a destination. <laughs> but how do you picture her ladyship in her house? She is unlike the Lady Catherine in Pride and Prejudice as you can conceive. Why would you think she's like Lady Catherine? She's the evil one, right? She's the antagonist in the, in the novel. In person, she is the most unpretending lady Claudia ever saw. She lives in a cottage, or rather a large house. At the end of the park in Charlton, I never saw anyone appear more happy than she does. She drives away, she said, we talked about love in a cottage, and could somebody of that much rank be in love and happy in living in a cottage? And the cottage uh, we have now identified as what is now the Dower House. This is Lady Catherine de Bourgh in the BBC version. You know, she's the one who goes, Will the halls of Pemberley thus be polluted if, if she's a real nasty one? And uh, this is the Dower House, what they call the Dower House today. But I have old documents proving that it was called Charlton Cottage. And so I'm supposed to go speak in Charlton this summer, and they're going to let me see the Dower House on the inside. That's where they lived. And then I'm just going to fast forward one other thing. This is a little bit speculative, but I'll show you the kind of thing that's happening when I, when I think about Jane Austen and this. Sorry. This is from a newspaper. It's the Cheltenham newspaper. You'll see the year is April 28, 1814. Uh, Lady Catherine has uh, now already changed her mind and been turned down, right? George mm -hmm. says no. Now, Cheltenham is a spa, kind of like Bath. It's not very far from my village. And it always reports who comes in, you know, the fashionable set, who comes in. And so the Earl of Suffolk and Lady Catherine Howard, that's got to be her. And there's a Mrs. Lee, that could be my Julia Lee, who the letters are written to, uh, from Twizzleton. Miss Austin. And a Miss Poulter. Well, Poulter is one of the names of the Bissett letters. That is the, he is the vicar at Alton, which is the next biggest village from where Jane Austen lives. Jane Austen often goes into Alton to shop. Okay, Alton's a big city for her, not city, they don't use the word city, a big village for her. And does a lot of shopping, goes to the fairs. Well, the main ecclesiastical man there is named Poulter, and he is high ranking in the church cathedral at Winchester. You know she's buried at Winchester. I, so I have speculated. Everyone has often wondered, how does that girl get buried at Winchester Cathedral? I think it's a Poulter connection. But that's going to take some more research. Poulter is a long-term friend of Bissett. So back in the day, when he's first a clergyman, George, is a clergyman in Hampshire in a little village called Minnestock. And he's a curate which means he's the lowest man on the totem pole and he's being hired by the vicar. The vicar is Poulter. And then George moves and does the rest of his career in Wiltshire. He and Poulter stay connected. And Poulter and his wife come during the visit love letters and actually watch Lady Catherine. I think she suffers from that much anxiety. She has people stay with her. And um, anyway, I'm just saying that I don't know if they could have met but she starts writing it in August of 15. So I think it's possible. Other questions, and I know I'm pressing time. When is the book due? <laughs> My goal is to have the um, book proposals out to several publishers by Christmas. So um, all of them are in, all of the parts that they need for the book proposal are definitely formed, just not perfected. So I'm going to try to send about 30 to 40 percent of the letters. I'm not going to send the whole thing, um, the best of the letters. And uh, you have to have your bibliography, and we're going to put some images in there. We're going to put some Broughton Castle letters in the book, Visit Love Letters. So uh, it was just the Visit Love Letters, but now we've decided we've got these Broughton Castle letters. Those are pretty exciting. Put four or five of those in there. We've got some images. Some of the images I own, some of them the Earl's brother owns, and they'll give me permission to put them in there. So. Um.
Uh, I work at it again until 2 a.m. every night. So. <laughs> I love it and I'm obsessed. And it's not my only research project. I have some other really good ones. Really, really good ones. Um, yes. I'm sure it will have the word biscuit in it. <laughs> and I can't decide if, um, so, so if you go, I'll, I will try for Oxford University to publish a publisher and I'll probably get turned down. But that would have to have a little uh, more academic title. Because it's a very good primary source, you see, for not just uh, a romance, but you will not believe that I think there's over 400 people mentioned in the love letters. And that's why the footnoting is taking so long. So the social connections and the, the, all the ways he travels and he tells her all kinds of details. It is funny. They get robbed one day by a stagecoach. He sees the guy flying the kite. They stop and they're like, there's some guy pull it, trying to pull a carriage with a kite, and that turns out to be something pretty famous. Yeah, you're going to try to print, and there's an original print of that. A guy who's doing these can go 20 miles an hour. <laughs> George will tell you how, many, how long it took to go from this town to this town. He's going into London often. But the people that he associates with in London are a whole new world for him because he's the only in-law of the Earl. But he loves her. He adores Lady Catherine. You always wonder, did he, did he do it just for the Ray? Oh my gosh, he's so devoted to her. Every letter. He just, uh, he's worried about her, he's concerned about her, he's concerned about her mental health. He runs errands for her all over London at the dressmaker <coughs> and the milliner and um, visits her family, tells her all kinds of details about the children, all these nieces and nephews, and they raise two of them. The youngest two of the Earl of Suffolk um, really stay living with visits quite a bit. And they're called Maggie and Fatty. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much more to tell you. But uh, that is an intro to visit love letters. And uh, amazing. it is just an amazing story. And it just gets more amazing the more I research. I need to now cut off the research <laughs> completely, which is the funnest part. And only, only right. So we need to cut it off completely because I'm always going, oh, it's kind of like treasure hunting. It is. You get addicted. <laughs>